We've had a couple of days now to digest the deluge of information about Fallout 76 that came out of Bethesda's Greenbrier event. I published three videos that focused on lore, but now I want to talk about some of the things I noticed that distinguished the gameplay of Fallout 76 from the gameplay we're familiar with from past titles. I also want to talk about a few lore implications. Let's start by talking about weapons, crafting, and inventory. Like in Fallout 4, we find an option to tag Scrap for search. Scrap has an even larger role in Fallout 76 than it does in Fallout 4. Like in Fallout's 3 in New Vegas, weapons now have condition. And yes, they can break even when you're in the middle of combat. <laughs> This may be frustrating to some, but honestly, it doesn't bother me. It makes finding other similar weapons more useful and, of course, makes scrap more valuable. In Fallout 76, chems and ammo now have weight, similar to survival mode from Fallout 4. But thankfully, the weights of these items are far lighter than they are in Fallout 4. So even though the weight of these items will give us a limit to how much we can carry with us, we'll still be able to carry a lot. There are different variants of chems. We remember super versions of chems from previous Fallout titles, like the Super Stim Pack, which we were introduced to in the very first Fallout, but in addition to super versions of chems, in Fallout 76 we find diluted versions of chems. Comparing the two, it looks like the diluted version gives half the benefit of the undiluted version. Here I am using a regular stim pack. The stim pack functions a little differently in 76. We get a big burst of instant healing, then the rest of the healing is slowly delivered until it fills the total healed amount. Whereas with the diluted stim pack, it also gives us a burst of healing and then slowly fills the rest of the amount, but we get about half of what the regular stim pack would have healed us. We find diluted versions of other chems as well, and presumably those will also give us about half the benefit. One great departure from Fallout 4 is that in Fallout 76, we can only have one chem active at a time. So we now have to be much more deliberate and to choose more wisely when using chems. My default freakout mode in Fallout 4 is just to consume every chem I've got in my inventory, but now there's no point to doing that. Only one can be active at a time. There are over 70,000 different items to find in the game. These are vanilla items that come with the game, not cosmetic items we can purchase from the Atom Shop. And yes, we will find legendary weapons and armor, like we did in Fallout 4. One thing I can only speculate about, I found some blank holotapes on the inventory of a Bethesda dev, and I don't know what this means. Does this mean that we can record our own holotapes and share them with other players? That's pure speculation, I don't really know. But if so, that would be a fun feature. Bartering with other players is pretty robust. We have a number of options. We can offer our own items for trade and set a price for each item. And if we find something in our friend's inventory, we can request that item for trade, even if he hasn't made it available for trade yet. We can filter our friend's inventory by only items that the friend has on offer, making it easier to see what's for sale. I saw a nuclear key card on the inventory of this Bethesda dev, which gives us the impression that we can trade them, and I believe this has some important implications. I'm not entirely sure how the nuclear launch works, but this didn't look like a unique item. It's not like this is listed as nuclear key card alpha omega victor. It's just called a nuclear key card. This gives me the impression that we just need seven or eight key cards to launch a nuke. If that's the case, then it's entirely possible for solo players to collect key cards over time or purchase them from other players and launch nukes by themselves. Bethesda has depicted the nuke launching ability as really the premier end game content, one of the hardest things to achieve, something that requires a lot of team cooperation. But to find out that we can do even this as a solo player is great news for those of us who really just want to play the game by ourselves. Like in previous Fallouts, we can collect recipes and plans for crafting new food items, settlement objects, weapons, and all sorts of stuff. Once we collect a new plan or recipe, we have to read it by clicking on it in our inventory. This consumes the plan or recipe. Unlike in Fallout 3, however, we can't consume additional versions of the same plan to get an updated version of that item. We can collect more than one plan for the same item, but reading the book again doesn't do anything for us. 
Instead, we can barter the items. I foresee this being a way for a player right out of the vault to find a merchant and purchase all of the plans and recipes he or she needs to craft important items at an early level. Another thing I noticed is that we can wear other clothing items like jeans and t-shirts over our vault jumpsuit. I also heard from Bethesda devs that we can wear specialized cosmetic clothing over our armor so that we can remain highly armored while still looking the way we want to. And yes, there are wandering merchants in the game. I bumped into a wandering super mutant merchant named Legendary Graham. Don't ask me where I got this stuff. He didn't have a lot on his inventory, just three plans for a dresser, an office desk, and a park bench. Smarty said once, Graham, you follow your heart till it stops, but heart is made of meat. Good meat is not free, gotta trade. So follow the trades till they stop. Though he did have a pack Brahmin called Chally the Moo Moo. <laughs> okay. Multiplayer has made questing a bit different in 76 compared to 4. We can, of course, go off and do our own thing, completing our own quests, but we can also team up with other players to complete quests together. Once we are in a party, the team leader can share quests with everyone in the party. Then taking a look at our quest log, we see our own personal quests that we're on, but the quest that the party leader has shared with us appears as a star in our list. Notice here that I have two different quests as part of the same chain active. I have the first part of the primary quest active in my quest log. I have to find the Overseer's camp. But then the one we get directly after this, tracking down the Overseer in Flatwoods, is also in my quest log because my team leader shared it with me, and it has a star by it. When grouped with teammates and when quests are shared, we appear to get the benefit of completing those quests and events even if we didn't actually do anything. There were a number of occasions when I got quest rewards like caps and loot, even if I was in a completely different area. New in Fallout 76 are public events. When approaching a public event, we get a notification telling us that we're about to start one. If we get close enough to the event, we automatically join it. We don't have to complete it. If we just walk away, it'll disappear when the event is over. And these events are timed. In this instance, I've got to repair this Mr. Handy and then escort him to the place where he's trying to deliver a message. This event had a 30-minute timer. Presumably, if we didn't finish it on time, everyone working on it failed it. But if we complete it, everyone in the area who was working on it gets the rewards. There are a few things I noticed about combat. Like in Fallout 4, radiation eats away at our maximum health. We have to remove our radiation poisoning before we can enjoy our maximum HP. In Fallout 76, being thirsty or hungry eats away at our AP, much like radiation ate away at our HP. In this example, I'm already dehydrated, and you can see my maximum AP has been eaten away. Here, my thirst bar goes all the way to empty, and now my AP is crippled. I only have access to half of it. Also, when thirsty or hungry, we lose a small amount of HP over time. Here, my HP is slowly getting eaten away until I drink some water. There is stealth in the game. There were a few instances where I was able to evade enemies simply by hiding, and we can land sneak criticals. One new thing is that apparently these cars in the world have health meters. Perhaps it takes a concerted effort or a group effort to destroy a car so that it explodes. There are a few lore things I noticed. When reading the terminals inside Vault 76, we kind of get the impression that vault Tech is still around. There's one instance where the Overseer says, vault Tech says that we are the best hope for America. It's interesting that she uses the present tense form of the word say. Instead of saying that vault Tech said, she said vault Tech says. Additionally, we learn from the terminals that the residents of Vault 76 couldn't leave until they got an activation notice. But from whom? Who sent the activation notice? Was it an automated activation notice that just happened after 25 years? Or was it sent by some sort of intelligent computer? Or did they hear from vault Tech? Could vault Tech still be around? Additionally, the Overseer's job was to leave the vault to secure three nuclear silos, Alpha, Charlie, Bravo. Her instructions from vault Tech were to secure these silos for vault Tech, even at the expense of any other faction, including remnants of the pre-war government. 
All of this together gives me the impression that, at least during the events of Fallout 76, there may be a vault tech presence still extant in the world, giving orders to people and trying to accrue power. There will be factions in Fallout 76, one of which is the Responders faction that we learned a little bit about in the ruins of Flatwoods, but also the Brotherhood of Steel. While I was exploring the inventory of the Bethesda dev, we found Brotherhood fatigues. How could these be here? Now, we know from the events of Fallout 1 that the Brotherhood of Steel did exist during the events of Fallout 76. But on the other side of the continent, Captain Maxon had seceded from the United States government a few days before the bombs dropped. He then led the remnants of the U.S. military at the Mariposa military base in an exodus to the Lost Hills fallout shelter in November of 2077. But we don't really hear from the Brotherhood of Steel again until 2134, when, as we learned from Fallout 1, Dennis Allen left Lost Hills for the glow to find some pre-war technology. But that takes place 32 years after the events of Fallout 76. I find it hard to believe that Maxon and the Brotherhood at Lost Hills during the events of Fallout 76 would have sent an expeditionary force all the way to West Virginia or the East Coast, though I suppose it's always possible. The events of Fallout 76 do take place 25 years after the Brotherhood arrives safely at Lost Hills. That gives any Brotherhood expeditionary force 25 years to make it from the West Coast to West Virginia, which is entirely possible, even by foot. Speaking of the Brotherhood, there are vertebrates in the game. Well, vertebrate drones, really. I didn't get to experience any up close, but I saw them flying in the sky off in the distance. Though I don't think they have anything to do with the Brotherhood, as they sometimes issue government aid drops. We received a government aid drop after completing a nearby event, and this was the doing of the local government. I think these are automated aid drops. We also learned that something happened to the survivors of the nuclear apocalypse living in West Virginia in November of 2096. All of the terminal entries we read from the responders and many of the other notes left by the survivors in Flatwoods were dated no later than November of 2096. And then, of course, there were all of the corpses. But what was this event that presumably killed everyone in November of 2096? Could it have anything to do with the scorched we find wandering around? I get the impression that bacteria and viruses might have something to do with it. After all, the responders spent a lot of time talking about how we should prepare water to avoid being sick. Perhaps whatever happened in 2096 is some sort of epidemic that might have produced the scorched and the petrified corpses we found. This is just speculation. I don't really know. There are a few lore things I want to touch on really quickly. We find caps in the game, and it's our primary currency. And I got some messages from viewers of my live stream wondering how there could be caps. We know from established lore that the reason caps were used as a currency on the West Coast at least is because the water merchants at the hub supported the value of the bottle cap with the value of water. So many people were wondering how could people be using bottle caps as currency on the East Coast or in West Virginia if the water merchants from the hub likely had no influence over here, them being all the way on the West Coast. This doesn't need to be a lore issue at all. And the reason is because just because the value of caps was established in one way in one place on the West Coast doesn't mean that that's the only way caps can be given value ever in the entire world. This is shown by the events of Fallout New Vegas, where 200 years after the apocalypse, and many decades after the hub water merchants backed the bottle cap with the value of water, we still find bottle caps being used as currency. By this time, the New California Republic had become the dominant government force on the West Coast. The water merchants no longer held the influence they once did during the events of Fallout 1, and instead, there's a brand new currency called the New California Republic Dollar, which was backed by gold, not water. But despite this, during the events of Fallout New Vegas, the bottle cap is still more valuable. 
NCR soldiers were frequently converting their NCR dollars into caps. And if you go to any of the casinos, you get far fewer chips to gamble with if you were to convert your NCR dollars than if you were to convert caps. So even in the lore of the West Coast, water is no longer the factor that gives the cap its value by the events of Fallout New Vegas. The point being that caps are still valuable, still used as a primary currency in New Vegas even though they're not backed by the water merchants of the hub. There's no reason to insist that every bottle cap has to be backed by the value of water everywhere in the Fallout universe throughout time, just because at one point in Fallout history that was the case in one specific location on the West Coast. The cap became valuable to begin with because there's a finite number of them. Only so many bottles of Nuka-Cola or Sunset Sarsaparilla or Vim were produced before the war. After the war, no more soda is being produced. So there's a limited number of caps which makes them valuable. But at the same time, so much cola was produced that the cap is an easy currency to work with. It's small, it's portable, and it's totally possible for the cap to have become a currency on the West Coast and on the East Coast or in West Virginia simultaneously with no other connection. So I don't see that as being a lore issue at all. Another lore issue that came up during one of my live streams is the existence of super mutants, but again, this isn't a lore issue at all. A super mutant is created when a human is dunked in the forced evolutionary virus, but we know from the events of Fallout 1 that the forced evolutionary virus was a pre-war experiment done by the government. The experiment first took place at the West Tech facility, which became the GLOW, then that experiment moved to the Mariposa military base. But as we learn from the events of Fallout 3, those are not the only places where humanity experimented with FEV. The reason we find super mutants in the capital wasteland during the events of Fallout 3 is because the experiment at Vault 80 seven was experimenting with the forced evolutionary virus. That experiment led to the creation of super mutants and centaurs which have been plaguing people of the capital wastelands. And the reason we have super mutants during Fallout 4 is because the Institute was using FEV to create their own race of superhumans before they abandoned that experiment. But while experimenting with FEV, they created the Commonwealth, a variant of the super mutant that has been plaguing people of the Commonwealth. So it's already established lore that the government or vault has been experimenting with FEV both on the West Coast and the East Coast before the war. It's totally possible we'll find a vault or a bunker or some other pre-war experiment in West Virginia where they were experimenting with FEV, which could have led to the super mutants we find in West Virginia. Again, this doesn't need to be a lore-breaking issue at all. So there we are. Those are some of the things I noticed about Fallout 76 while playing it. So to answer the question I've been getting on every video I've published about Fallout 76, did I enjoy it and what are my thoughts on it? Yeah, I enjoyed it and here are my thoughts. Fallout 76 is not Fallout 5. It's not meant to be Fallout 5. It was never designed to be Fallout 5. It's not a sequel to Fallout 4. It's not the next game in the Fallout series. It's a side thing, kind of like how Fallout Shelter is a side thing. It's a very different game from many of the other Fallout games. Fallout 76 is a different kind of game from the Fallout games. There will be some people who just don't like the multiplayer aspect of it, and I totally get that. There's just something irreplaceable about the single-player experience we get in big open-world games like the previous Fallout titles. This game isn't meant to replace that. I'm still looking forward to it though because it has many of the things about the Fallout franchise that I like. As I was able to demonstrate in my previous videos, the game is chocked full of lore. Not only quests, not only a primary story, but lots of side stories, lots of environmental storytelling. The game is not just all about gunplay and events and grouping and taking down big monsters, it's also about giving us lush environments, intricately handmade ruins, with notes and terminals and posed skeletons and all of the things that I loved most about playing previous Fallout games. The gameplay changes that they did make are gonna take some getting used to. All of the new perk cards, the survival mechanics, the changes they've made to consumables, but it's all still familiar enough that I don't feel lost when playing the game. It doesn't feel out of place. It feels a lot like Fallout 4. It looks a lot like Fallout 4. I think Fallout 76 adequately fulfills the question that inspired the game. What if Fallout 4 was multiplayer? And that's what they made. I think anyone who is really pleased with Fallout 4 is going to feel comfortable walking right into Fallout 76 and being able to pick it up pretty quickly. 
I walked away from my short time being able to play the game, having moved away from being cautiously optimistic to being very optimistic. Bethesda clearly put a lot of time and attention into the game. It doesn't feel hastily put together. It's not procedurally generated. It's not just a multiplayer mod of Fallout 4. There are 70,000 items in this game we can find. They improved a lot of the visuals of Fallout 4. And there's a brand new story. A story that we got a taste of and one that I'm really interested in piecing together to better understand. I walked away wanting more of it, and that's always a good sign. But those are just my thoughts and my impressions. What are your thoughts of all of the footage you've watched about Fallout 76 over the past few days? Has it made you feel more comfortable with the idea of a multiplayer version of Fallout? Is the story that you've heard so far compelling? Do you like the new gameplay mechanics? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many Fallout videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs you can't find anywhere else. My shirts come in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. They also come in other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, prints, etc. So if you're interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.